please don't forget to remain your microphones muted, please. The chat is open for your comments and questions uh, for our dialogue at the end of the presentation. In this session, Stephen Jones and Rebecca Cato will share with us about the identification with science and the public understanding of evolution in the West. And we thank you for your willingness, Rebecca and Stephen, for being here today. Stephen Jones is a lecturer in the Sociology of Science and Religion at the University of Birmingham in UK. He's a sociologist who specializes in the study of Islam and Muslims in the UK and religious and non-religious public's perception of science. His research has focused on themes including Islam and liberalism, Islamophobia in contemporary Britain, Muslims' perception of science and religious diversity and inclusion in STEAM institutions and disciplines, which is the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. And Rebecca Cato is an assistant professor of sociology at Kent State University in Ohio, USA. Her research is grounded in the sociology of religion and connected by an overreaching interest in how the secular and religious interact, particularly in Europe and North America. She's attentive to power relations and social justice issues in this dynamics, and is interested in the interfaith and intercultural dialogue, science and religion, and in the young people's religious and political participations. And they are both part of the International Research Network for the Study of Science and Belief in Society. And among many publications, recently the Bristol University Press published their book, Science, Belief and Society, International Perspectives on Religion, Non-Religion and the Public Understanding of Science that they edited with Tom Caden. So welcome. And as Rafael said, it's now it's not the floor is yours, but the screen is yours and the microphones too. Thank you, Cecilia, and uh, thanks on behalf of Rebecca as well. So Rebecca will be taking the second half of this presentation, and I will try my best to only take up the first half of the presentation. Um, it's very uh, good to be here. Uh, I say here, and here is uh, the north of England in Cheshire, but in, uh, in electronic form at least. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that we, uh, Rebecca and I, worked on um, between around 2014 and 2017. Uh, so it's not dealing with COVID related data, although we'll try and weave in some of the ways in which it's re re relevant to our current situation. Uh, but I'm gonna talk particularly about some of, some of our survey research about to do with, with science and people's perceptions of science. And then Rebecca will go on to talk about science in the workplace. So I'm gonna try and share my screen now. Hopefully this will uh, work fine. And you should see a... Uh, PowerPoint coming up. Um, any problems with that at any point, uh, send me a note or shout out or something. Uh, so the, the project in question um, as I say, is called Science and Religion Exploring the Spectrum. Um, it's a very uh, large project and uh, ran in its first iteration in the United Kingdom and Canada. It's now going um, more international, but I will leave it to um, others who will be presenting tomorrow to talk more about that. Um, for now, I just want to sort of give some of the background to that project, first of all, and then talk through uh, some of our findings and, uh, and, uh, and some of the, the implications of those findings. Uh, so the project really stems, it's set up by uh, my colleague at University of Birmingham, Professor Fern Alston Baker, who, when she initially developed the idea with Rebecca and, and Carol Light at the University of Kent in the UK, um, were wrestling with the way in which si questions about science and religion uh, as, as interrelated subjects are dealt with in, in social research. Uh, science and religion is a subject that is well covered in philosophy and theology and in, in, in particular in history where there's been a general move towards uh, un undermining and picking apart what's sometimes called the epistemological conflict thesis, the idea that science and religion are intention. Um, but uh, the, the interesting thing now is really the idea that this kind of conflict thesis is, in the words of uh, Nolan Livingstone, the idea that won't die. Because as, despite it doesn't matter how many times um, historians manage to pull apart its basic assumptions, it still has purchase within 
certain cultural contexts in the West, particularly perhaps the, the Anglophone West. Um, so uh, it, it maintained its cultural hold, if you will. And what um, Fern was uh, thinking through when she developed the, the, the project was that part of the reason uh, that that kind of notion maintains a hold, uh, not, not the full reason, but part of the reason at least, is that social research has tended to assume, and embed in its methods even, uh, epistemological drivers to that kind of conflict, rather than focus on questions around culture, around identity, and around morality. And a lot of the social scientific research into uh, science and religion more recently has moved in that direction, whereas previously it tended to work on the basis that what was important here was to study frameworks of knowledge. So for example, one way in which this has manifested itself over the years is a focus on religious knowledge being, in a sense, the independent variable in studying responses to science. So thinking about how, for example, if you are an evangelical Christian, how do you respond to the theory of evolution? And that's something that we wanted to try and and not necessarily reject because obviously the religious beliefs one hold does have an impact upon the kind of perceptions one has of science in certain countries and contexts at least but but perhaps move into a slightly different terrain and in some ways put that approach on its head and i'll, I'll talk a bit more about what i mean by that in just a moment so the general the central question for the, the project as a whole has always been what social and cultural factors have driven and are currently driving the narrative in the public domain that there's a necessary clash between religious belief and acceptance of evolutionary science. And bear in mind, this is a project that relates primarily to Anglophone contexts of so the United Kingdom and Canada, where um, to some degree we can take it as read that that's a kind of public narrative. It's less the case in, in other states, of course. And so what the project sought to do was try and look at different, in different ways and using different methods are the kinds of ways in which people describe the relationship between science and religion, both in public media and in their own internal lives, how they kind of wrestle with the subject matter. And it's a, it, as I say it's quite a large project, and it's a large project mainly because it, it's not something that just involves uh, sociologists uh, like myself and Rebecca, but also a range of different disciplines. So it has four strands, which I'll go through very quickly. Um, um, we have little research units in, dedicated to those different strands. So firstly, strand one, which is me and Rebecca, uh, dealing with qualitative analysis of interview and focus group data. Uh, strand two we call, uh, it's known as, uh, so, sorry, um, strand two deals with uh, questions about history and historical representation, so global histories, um, media representations, recent 20th century history, and then strand three, uh, involves social psychologists, social, ex social and experimental psychology, which focuses in particular on social identity formation. And then strand four, which deals with quantitative analysis, so large scale surveys uh, of nationally representative populations. And the ones I'm going to talk about here, I'm going to talk mainly about strand one, but I will draw uh, some of the very basic findings from strand four. It'll be lot, sort of some top level descriptive statistics to contextualize what I say but most of it is going to be focusing on, on strand one. So strand one, uh, the qualitative research, has involved in, in the first iteration of science and religion exploring the spectrum, um, 123 interviews and 16 focus groups, and they were split evenly, almost evenly at least, between the United Kingdom and Canada. Uh, the Canadian interviews were uh, conducted by my colleague Tom Carden, um, and they were split um, at a ratio of roughly two to one between members of the public who were recruited through a pre-screening survey in order to try and get a heterogeneous population, and then uh, professional scientists working in the life, biological and medical science, sciences. And then we supplemented that with focus groups of the same populations, uh, again split 50-50 between the two countries, uh, and, and, and split between five um, focus groups with members of the public to three with scientists. And I can say a bit more about the, the specific sampling there in questions if people want. So I won't go into too, too much detail. So the particular, we've done quite a lot of, it's, as I say, it was a project that finished in 2017. So we've had time to write up most of our findings and that's the book on the left there that Cecilia mentioned in the introduction. And we have a few papers out on sociological review and sociology compass and uh, 
various others. The one I'm going to focus most of my attention on here is this one on the bottom left, in a paper in Public Understanding of Science on the subject of science identification. Um, and that's, that paper is, is where I try and, in a sense, kind of turn the tables on the usual study of science and religion, which has tended to focus on religion as an independent variable, where what we've tried to do instead is look at the ways in which people uh, identify with science. So in the public understanding of science, certainly in the United Kingdom where I'm based, uh, there's a very rich tradition of social research in uh, the sociology of science that deals with how people, um, it, it works on different, um, different levels. So firstly, the question of um, whether people actually agree with scientific theories. Do they uh, deny scientific theories or reject them? Evolution being an, uh, one obvious case and, and the one that we focused on ourselves. <clears throat> Uh, then it deals with questions about trust in science. Do we trust scientists? And then it deals with questions of engagement with science. So uh, do people have an interest in science? What kind of person goes into a scientific career and so on? What it doesn't deal with so much, though, is how people, in a sense, embed or make a claim upon science in their own personal worldviews. It's often sort of almost taken as read within that particular subdiscipline that uh, science is com it's sometimes written about almost as a kind of re re elite remote activity away from people's wider world views. And what we want to set out to do is, in some senses, challenge that because it wasn't reflected in our data. Um, it, it was very obvious that it wasn't reflected in our data in some of the quantitative findings. So I'm just going to sketch through those now. Um, and just to give a bit of a background to the, uh, the quantitative, the qualitative data, sorry. So there were a few questions we did nationally representative surveys uh, conducted by the, uh, the polling agency YouGov, um, which, in which we asked various questions about evolution belief, about people's personal beliefs, people's perceptions of others. Rebecca's going to talk a bit more about the questions around evolution belief. I want to start by focusing on the ones we asked about people's interest in and views of science. And there are a few we asked about that and very striking findings we came up with. So firstly, we asked people's Asked ask the participants, both in the UK and in Canada, about their interest in various subjects. So we asked them about how interested are you in sports, politics, theatre and arts, religion, new, and then various scientific subjects. And what was most striking about this particular question is, as you can see here, the science subjects came out top above everything else. Even something that seems to me to be quite... Uh, a technical and very specific area. So we asked people, how interested are, are you interested in new ideas and discoveries in genetics and genomics? And more people said they took an interest in that subject than they said took an interest in sports, which strikes me as a very curious finding. I, I'm somewhat skeptical that actually the people responding to this survey spend more time reading genetics and genomics than they do reading the sports pages of their newspapers. But it does seem to suggest a very strong kind of social desirability effect, uh, a willingness or a, feel, a feeling that you have to take an interest in scientific subjects because of its, the way science is positioned in society. More revealing still, I think, was this question, where we asked people to, but we asked people to s say whether or not they feel that science, first of all, and then evolutionary science, these were two separate questions, uh, is important to their sense of who they are and how they view the world. Um, so this is not a, we, we weren't, I don't think we've seen any questions quite similar to this put, uh, formulated in the UK. So we didn't exactly know what the findings would be. But what really struck out is that uh, a majority, so not, not a clear majority in the case of the evolutionary science question. You can see here 44% uh, in the UK and 48% in Canada said that uh, evolutionary science is important to their sense of who they are and how they view the world. A slightly higher number, I haven't got the slide here, but a higher percentage, sorry, said that the same for science more generally, around 55% in the UK, and I think 56 in Canada if I go from memory, uh, certainly around those figures. So we, we're looking at the number of people who said it was important vastly outweighed the number of people who said it wasn't, suggesting that, that we're not quite sure how or why exactly, but a lot of people seem to feel like they are invested or in some case identifying with science. And then what's another striking finding from the same survey is that we asked the same kinds of questions. You can see the specific phrasing of the questions here. 
for various other questions, not just science and evolutionary science, but um, people's religious views or non-religious views, people's political views, um, and then both the UK here at the bottom and then Canada. And science came up almost equal, sorry, above everything else. The only thing that it came equal to was your political stance in the UK. And I should probably mention that this survey was conducted about two weeks before the Brexit referendum. So the political uh, findings are somewhat anomalies. You can see this, I think, I haven't got the slide here specifically, but when we talk about politics interest, there was about a 20% gap between the, the United Kingdom and Canada. I think that's because of the time it was being conducted. It was a very unusual time in the UK's political history. So the extent to which people seem willing and able to, in some sense, identify with science is one of the really striking findings from this survey. And it's something that we really wanted to pull apart in the qualitative data. So that's what we did when we were going through our interviews and our focus groups. So what we spoke about was um, we, we asked people how, what, what their religious formation was, and then we asked them about their interest in science and how that developed. And there were four particular categories of type of science identification that we outlined from this. And they intervened in different sorts of social dynamics in various different ways. So I'll say something very quickly about those. So we, we developed four particular categories, what we called a practical sense of identification, where people have a sense of worth or purpose emerging from the ability to understand and carry out science. What we called a norm-based uh, form of identification, where it was rooted in a kind of correspondence between the procedural norms of science and good personal conduct. What we called the civilizational identification, which was rooted in a narrative of some kind of sense of social or cultural progress or civilizational advancement. And then finally, existential identification, where science formed a significant part of a narrative about ultimate well-being. Oh, sorry, about ultimate meaning. My apologies. Um, so I'm just going to explain a little bit about them, then say how they link together, and then I'll pass over to Rebecca. So the practical identification was in some ways the least surprising in the sense that most of the scientists we spoke to took some sense of their identity from their profession and their ability to um, engage with science as a form of practice. Scientists saying things like, I, uh, to use an English phrase, I'm not sure if it translates into other languages, uh, I'm a duck and there's water and that's my relationship with my professional work, I just fit to it, it's like I'm born to do it. Um, but we also found a very interesting kind of similar identification amongst those who had been through uh, technical education. So in the UK education system, particularly uh, for those who are above the age of around 50, it was strictly separated out into grammar schools and secondary moderns, as they're known. Um, whereas the, where, where the lower class people would tend to fail the tests and go into secondary modern schools. And we found various people who felt a sense of identification without with being able to do practical professional um, professional um, forms of jobs and roles that didn't so much involve kind of intellectual discussions but actually being able to do things and one of them was someone called Norman where he talked about uh, I'll use the quote here well I like you, the science of using materials I'm always interested in what's going on modern stuff like graphene and a lot of people like my friends he means by this his educated friends his university elite friends wouldn't have the foggiest idea of what graphene was. So this kind of practical identification was bound up with a certain form of class distinction. The second form of identification was um, what we call norm-based, where, which we found mostly among non-religious people, it was almost exclusively a non-religious thing, and tended to be, um, people, what people tended to do here was to associate science with free thinking, with deliberation and rational choice, and so people would talk about being scientific in the sense of being free to think for oneself rather than being told what to do, normally told what to do by a religious professional or clergy person or someone along those kinds of lines. Hence, it was a very much a strong non-religious sort of positioning. And it was the striking thing here was that it was very strongly associated with a liberal sort of outlook on life and political philosophy. And it was not associated, interestingly, with a strong science knowledge necessarily, it was found more amongst the members of the public than with the scientists. And we even found some people who would very strongly identify with this kind of liberal model of science identification, whilst having no real interest or even knowledge of science. There was one person called Kimberly, um, 
who I've put some quotations from here where she said, oh, you have to discover more things for yourself rather than being told what they are. That's her sort of reading what science is. But at the same time, that very um, view on life had also led her to taking on certain forms of complementary therapy for, for particular ailments she suffered from. And she talks about alternative therapies because there's something else going on. I guess we're discovering new particles like Hibbs boson and there's new stuff coming out all the time. So she was someone who uh, subscribed to certain ideas which are generally considered pseudoscientific, but nevertheless strongly identified with this particular model of science as almost as a kind of placeholder for an individualistic moral framework. The third civilizational identification was similar again, very much a non-religious, indeed anti-religious view, and where science was seen almost as like a, a kind of bulwark of protection against superstition. But what was striking here was that it diverged very strongly from the liberal model that we found, where it was less about reasoning and choice and more about protecting truth and more about protecting society from unwelcome invaders. The, the exemplary case here was someone called Cliff, we talked about same-sex marriage and self-identifying gender being epistemologically nonsense. And he was very much someone who was against postmodernism, against um, LGBT issues, against feminism. And the crucial thing here, and this wasn't just the case of Cliff, this was the case of a, probably a majority, I think, of the, the people we could broadly characterize under these um, categories uh, against Islam. So Islam is a direct threat to scientific rationality into European civilization. And that was something we have a whole paper on. Uh, but he talked about Islam being the enemy of everything. Uh, so he very much set and associated science with kind of European modernity and saw that as being under threat from Is Islam and Muslim immigration specifically. Finally, uh, we came to this existential form where people would talk about science as giving kind of sense of meaning to the universe. And that was found amongst both religious and non-religious people. The crucial thing here though, I would say, is that whereas the religious individuals tended to see uh, science as in a sense kind of revealing the truth of God's work, sort of su supporting and supplementing a religious view, those people who took this view of the non-religious uh, persuasion, which it has to be said was only a, f a fairly small number of interviewees, but they tended to see science as sort of giving meaning to the universe itself. There was someone we have on the bottom right here, um, trying to remember, Mickey, I think is, we've, we've termed him, obviously we're dealing with pseudonyms here. But he talks about having uh, science revealing a kind of cosmic evolutionary scope, the formation of elements and stars and galaxies, to chemical evolution, and the third phase being the origins of life. And then he was a transhumanist and went on to say, you can see the stage up. Now the next epoch is almost upon us and there's a new form of evolution right around the corner if we survive long enough to enable it. So just to bring my section to a close then, what I want us to really highlight here, this is a very quick overview um, and I'm happy to go into more depth in the discussion, obviously. But the thing I really want to hammer home here is that one might think if you're thinking through an epistemological lens that these kinds of identification might work together in a kind of logically consistent whole, like you might gain expertise in scientific methods, come to see those methods involving certain norms that are central to the flourishing of liberal democracies, begin to see those norms as kind of fundamental to social progress and worth defending, and then to sort of embed this understanding into a narrative concerning ultimate purpose of human life or of society. But that's not really how it worked. In our interviews in particular, they, what tended to emerge is that people would have kind of overlapping and weirdly intersecting views and identifications, and they were nearly always underpinned by particular media influences and particular forms of cultural and political loyalty. So this kind of sense of science identification, it's not necessarily an identification with a kind of knowledge tradition or with scientific institutions. It's a kind of felt cultural identification that emerged very strongly in our data and seems to pervade um, certainly the cultures of the two countries that we were working with. So I'll pass on to Rebecca now, because she wants to talk, she's going to talk a little bit about how that kind of uh, culture of science, so to speak, influences the working context of Christian scientists in particular. So I'll stop sharing and pass over to her, and she will start sharing from, I think, the same presentation. Yep, here we go. It's just, it's like the virtual equivalent of me getting up and taking the clicker. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so hello everybody, uh, and thank you as well for the opportunity to be here. So as Stephen was just saying, I am, I'm moving on now from uh, talking about science identification to looking more specifically at perceived conflict between science and religion in the scientific workplace and related to evolutionary science in particular. So similarly, I'm going to start this section with some of the survey data from the Science and Religion Project. So thinking about assumptions about religion and evolution, one assumption might be that it is um, religious people are going to have a problem, some kind of difficulty accepting evolutionary science. And yet when we look at the data from the survey, you can see here that it is a minority of spiritual and religious respondents in Canada and the UK who report experiencing or finding some difficulty accepting evolutionary science. And then if we look at non-religious, non-spiritual respondents, there is a, sm a small minority here, both in the Canada and UK, of people um, experiencing some difficulty accepting evolutionary science as well. So this shows us that this is not exclusively a religious issue, kind of shifting us away again from the idea of only religion as the independent variable, as Stephen was talking about. But yet, when asked about different categories of people, more people, both religious and non-religious, think that religious members of the public, and you can see here as well for the UK, um, a scientist who is religious, they think that they will have difficulty accepting inf information about evolutionary science in reference to their own personal beliefs or way of seeing the world. And this applies in Canada as well. So there's a mismatch going on here between what is actually the case and what people's perceptions of what religious people think related to evolutionary science are happening. And this misperception about others' attitudes has real social consequences, which emerged in our qualitative data collected with religious life scientists. So that's what I'm moving on to now. And here I'm drawing mainly upon this chapter, um, Science is Secular, which was published along with the chapter by Stephen and Tom in the main um, edited volume coming out from the project, edited there by the two co um, principal investigators, um, Stephen mentioned Fern and Bernie Lightman as well. So we found that when looking at the interview and focus group data, a difference between the way religious and non-religious scientists in both countries talked about religion in their workplace and their personal existential cultures. Both groups expressed the view that religion ought to be kept separate from scientific research. However, religious respondents tended to be reflexive about their own worldviews in relation to their work and reported some concerns and challenges regarding the interaction between the two. And by contrast, non-religious scientists appear to take the com complementarity between their scientific work and their existential culture for granted, and most tended to be somewhat suspicious of colleagues' actual or hypothetical re religiosity. So getting this, us back to this idea of this misperception of others' attitudes, including religious scientists. And I just have a few quotes here to illustrate this. So here you can see we have a male Christian scientist, um, a, a scientist who is a Christian, and uh, the, he was part of a focus group that Stephen conducted in the UK. And he talks about when he was appointed director of research at his institution um, in a meeting with his dean, proactively reassuring his dean that he's not, you know, he's a Christian, but he's not crazy. Uh, consciously distancing himself from creationism. So anticipating that his scientific credibility might be challenged by colleagues or questioned by colleagues because of his Christian identity. And similarly, Krista, a postdoc in astronomy in Canada and also a Christian, 
uh, talked about interactions uh, mainly at scientific conferences. So, you know, she starts off saying, like, I don't talk about Jesus all the time because, you know, we're there for the science to do the scientific work. But when it comes up, um, as, as she says, in relation to US politics, she's doing a similar thing there in terms of distancing herself. So, well, there's that, and then there's Christianity, and I am a Christian. So preemptively challenging stereotypes around science and Christianity. And then in contrast, you have, um, here we have Jean, a bio biology professor in Canada, who's an atheist and originally from the US. And so he spoke about feeling surrounded by like-minded others in his research community and recognizing that religious colleagues might keep quiet about that and uh, you know, it's recognizing that they're in the minority. And then Samantha, another biology professor in Canada, she talked about her own atheism in science and how the two do intertwine for her. But here she says they're not, they're not reliant on one another, but they're not separate either. And so then she says, I'm also always surprised when I find religious scientists scientists because again it's the how do you you know, how do you use that scientific framework that she sees herself using so it is this sense of there's this perceiving that there's a mesh between my non-religious worldview and my scientific work and that there's going to be some kind of difficulty and challenge there for a religious scientist so it wasn't that religious life scientists reported experiences of explicit hostility or discrimination in their workplaces, but rather you get this implicit association of science and non-religion emerging in the context, this kind of secular hegemony. And there's this religious secular boundary which is felt and experienced by religious and non-religious scientists and managed and policed by them both. Um, so that is, Im and so then is impacting lived experience. So adding to what Stephen was saying, this also contributes to our understanding of science as not just a form of professional practice, but also a cultural identity as well. So now, um, in the time remaining, I just want to bring it all together. We, um, you know, so thinking about this enthusiasm and overall support for science that Stephen presented about and the overall acceptance of evolutionary science from religious and non-religious people that we've seen, um, it's important not to assume that religious people are necessarily going to have a problem accepting evolution or other scientific concepts. This fits with what Paul was saying in the previous session about the relationship between religion and vaccine hesitancy, that actually it's an exception for religious communities to be um, vaccine hesitant. So, it, you know, it's a small number of religious people in the Canadian context specifically, as he was talking about. But then these assumptions do persist and some exclusionary boundaries get drawn. And so this speaks to the enduring power of what Stephen referred to as the idea that wouldn't die, that there is this inherent conflict between religion and science. And so from the ESFRAS project as a whole, from the survey research, the qualitative research, and also the historical and um, psychological research, we're finding this complex web of social and cultural factors driving this perception of a clash in the public sphere in Canada and the UK particularly. Um, but, and this brought up for us the need to widen this out and explore these dynamics, this complexity in different national contexts. So this leads me on to SRS2, which has already been mentioned, where uh, the methodolo methodology, the multidisciplinary approach, we've expanded it to, well, Spain. We're delighted that Cecilia, Ma and Rafael are working on the Spanish case study. And I understand Cecilia and Rafael will talk about it more tomorrow. Um, and then also Amrai is on the call working in Germany. Um, and we have uh, researchers in Australia, Argentina and Sri Lanka as well. And I'm doing an ethnography as part of the project here in Ohio in the USA too. So I 
so obviously this, as, as Stephen mentioned, the first project was conducted before the pandemic hit. And then I think the second project, we were, all the different case study countries are, were at different points of data collection and setup when the pandemic hit. Um, so I don't have too much to say about religion and science and COVID-19 specifically, but we did want to um, reflect on, just talk about some of the methodological challenges that have already come up for SRES2, practically moving the data collection online, including focus groups, and I'm still figuring out how to adapt my ethnographic research to online uh, people in different countries, found some ethical impacts. You know, if people are facing economic hardship, they're in a national context with economic hardship, then is there a risk of compensation for research participation becoming coercive? And people adapted in terms of offering the option to donate to a charity instead of, to take, of taking the voucher. And as people were designing, um, the questions, the survey guide, the interview guides, thinking about we don't, this is happening now and it's such a fast moving situation that varies so much between national contexts. We don't want to restrict the research to COVID-19 or kind of freeze it in time too much either. So challenging addressing it because it's very relevant to the topic of science and religion and not being limited by it either. And um, this, perhaps Amra, I can speak to this as well in the discussion. Some participants have apparently actually reported enjoying the opportunity to speak online to someone outside of their own household, depending on you know, the stage of lockdown that they're at, and um, talking about something different. And um, I just wanted to mention about a methodological challenge as well for SRES2 has been from the Canadian and British context, where there is this public hash narrative around religion and science, not wanting to import in the project design that kind of conflict model or impose it upon national contexts where there isn't this kind of public debate about science and religion that there is in the UK and Canada. So that brings us on to some reflections for thinking about science and religion and COVID-19 to think you know, most of research to date on science and religion has been conducted in the US and there are, as Paul mentioned as well, these very specific polarized political dynamics in the US. And so we can't just export from that to the rest of the world. And this, you know, looking at specific contexts involves examining the political dynamics in the public sphere and the media as part of that, as is coming up in SRS2. And this is just a, sort of more of a hypothetical at this point from Stephen that, you know, perhaps there's um, going to be an impact on science and identification and perceptions of science with the pandemic. But, you know, we'll have to see that as findings emerge.